Today, uh, we're going to be diving into Joshua and Judges. I know that many of us are uh, shaped by a vision of what God is like in Christ Jesus, how he's been revealed. We'll struggle perhaps with the violence in these books. In Judges chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, we read this. These are the nations that the Lord left in the land to test those Israelites who had not experienced the wars of Canaan. He did this to teach warfare to generations of Israelites who had no experience in battle. These are the nations, the Philistines, those living in the five Philistine rulers, all the Canaanites, the Sidonites, the Hivites, those in the mountains of Lebanon, Mount Baal Hermon to Mount Libo Hamath. These are the people left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the commands that the Lord had given to their ancestors through Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they intermarried with them. Israelite sons married their daughters. Israelite daughters were given in marriage to their sons. And the Israelites served their gods. So that's the a passage from the Judges. And we notice there that the nations that the Israelites were called to drive out, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, are in fact still in the land. Verses 5 and 6 say, so the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and they intermarried with them. Israelite sons married their daughters. The Israelite daughters were given in marriage to their sons, and the Israelites served their gods. So here's the question. If we're to read the book of Joshua as the story of Israel totally wiping out all of the nations in the land, then why... A couple of generations later, in the time of the judges, are they still in the land? And not only that, why are Israel marrying them and worshipping their gods? These verses which speak of life after the conquest should tell us something about how we're to understand what the conquest was about and what took place. We know the Israelites aren't going around committing mass genocide because all the nations are still in the land after the conquest. That's why they're marrying them. Um, the book of Joshua picks up just after Moses had died, when the 12 tribes of Israel are camped outside the land and God had promised to give them. When reading the book, we need to remember that the Bible was uh, written for us, but it wasn't written to us. It was written in Hebrew thousands of years ago two people thousands of years ago. It was written by Bronze Age, Iron Age people for Bronze and Iron Age people. And God spoke in God's people in various ways so in Moses day in Moses sort of ways in David's day in David's way in Isaiah's day in Isaiah ways in Jesus days in Jesus ways in Paul's day in Paul's way and when we read this book closely we're confronted with the command given by God to completely to destroy or to devote to destruction this city this town or this people and God had promised the 12 tribes of Israel a, a homeland a promised land the only trouble was that the people already lived there and God tells Joshua to go into this land and completely destroy or devote to destruction this city this town this people and that's utterly shocking for us today how can God revealed in Jesus the one same one who says love your enemies also say completely destroy this city and the Hebrew word is translated in the NLT as completely destroys harem and the word literally means remove from use for the Lord's sake dedicate it to the Lord as it were and a number of scholars argue that the meaning of the term should not be interpreted as a total destruction of individuals but rather the destruction of their identity so remember God spoke to his people in different days in different ways so in Joshua's day in Joshua ways and for Bronze Age people you're defined by your tribal your cultural and your religious identity so we should not think the Canaanites were all put to the sword rather their identity is destroyed by an Israelite identity and this would explain why we're told that all those nations are still living in the land. They're still marrying with the Israelites and they're corrupting them by worshipping their gods. And the Israelites are a tribal people and their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, had lived in Canaan. 
<laughs> you know, they'd lived there. And they were related to the people living in the land and around Canaan. Uh, and they're coming back, as it were, to the land of their ancestors after their slavery in Egypt. And the purpose of the harem completely destroy command against the Canaanite nations is to utterly destroy their community identity, not to kill all the people. An example of this is Joshua 11, 22, 23. All of the northern cities are described as harem, but Joshua only destroys Hazor. Okay. Um, I've mentioned previously that it's a careful reading of the conquest narratives of Canaan. And we notice that the places where Joshua and the Israelites attack are linked directly to the quote unquote giant clans said to be living in the land. At the end of the book of Joshua, in Joshua 11, 22, we're told none of the descendants of Anak were left in the land of Israel, though some still remained in Gaza, Gath and Ashdod. And that's where we meet Goliath, isn't it? Goliath of Gath. And the purpose of the devote to destruction command was to destroy all of these giant clans. And that's the reason for the book of Joshua. In, Josh, in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 20 to 23, we're told that many of the nations around Israel are also involved in this giant killing business. We read, the area once considered the land of the Rephaites who had lived there, though the Ammonites called them Zamzumites, and they were as strong and numerous and as tall as the Anakites. But the Lord destroyed them so that the Ammonites would occupy their land. He had done the same with the descendants of Esau, who lived in Seir. For he destroyed the Horites who are said to live there in that place. The descendants of Esau live there to this day. A similar thing happened where the Captorites from Crete invaded and destroyed the Avites who live in the villages in the area of Gaza. So God raised up these nations to destroy the giants. And I've mentioned previously that within ancient cultures, the story of this lost golden age that was destroyed in the flood there's always a small group of survivors. And in the Babylonian version, beings called the Abkhalu revealed to humans secret knowledge. Uh, but then the other gods become angry with them and they imprison them in the abyss, which is the depths of the waters under the Tigris and the Euphrates. However, the Ammonite kings of Babylon claim to possess this secret knowledge from before the flood in magic and in rituals, etc. And the Israelite version of the story is told in Genesis 6, when the sons of God come down and they marry human women and they give birth to the Nephilim. And in Genesis, when it was translated into the Greek in 250 BC, the 70 Jewish scribes living in Alexandria translated sons of God as angels of God. And they translated Nephilim as giants because that was their worldview. This is their origin story of the giant clans. So when we think about giants we shouldn't be thinking about dna in tribes that's how modern western people think um and we could go down a very dark hole there thinking about alien hybrids or whatever else but rather we need to just park that and think about other identity ritual identity okay we need to and I have used this previously, an example of the scholar uh, Stephen de Young uses of being an American citizen. You have certain rituals that you participate, certain feasts that you celebrate, the 4th of July, Thanksgiving. You've got voting, the initiation rituals where you swear to the flag and take a citizenship test. You've got all these rituals involved in becoming a citizen of the United States and having passed through those things, you're now an American. And it's the same for us as Christians. We join the group through a ritual called baptism, and then we maintain fellowship through a ritual called communion. And these are visible identity markers of me saying I am a Christian because I do these rituals. And they're what marks us out from the community around us, which don't participate in those things. To become an Israelite, you were circumcised and you ate the Passover. And it's important that these many people, and I've said it many times, in the Exodus story, they're not always the physical descendants of Abraham, and they even become leaders within Israel. And it's got nothing to do with their DNA, but to do with their ritual participation. People weren't members of these giant clans just because they happened to be born into them. Rather, they went through initiation rituals. They participated in the ritual life of the clan. And within 
Jewish tradition in books like First Enoch, the ritual life of these clans is spoken of as containing idolatry, sexual immorality, cannibalism, the drinking of human blood, and many of the laws in the Torah are asking Israel not to do those things that the clans have done. And I've mentioned before but based upon these cultic texts that we have from the Amorites and a likely historical scenario, if we were going to recreate it, is that the king of the city state would dress up as the local god. He would put on a mask, he'd summon his dead ancestors to possess him and to witness the ritual. And then he would ritually have sexual intercourse with a temple prostitute on a, a ritual bed to bring about fertility to the crops and to the fields and to cement an agreement between the God and the people. And a child born from this ritual would be considered a demigod because the God was thought to have possessed the king's body as he did the ritual. So it's a bit like that bed mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 11. We're told that Og, one of the last giants, possesses this ritual bed and we're given the, the, the dimensions of it. And the ritual would be accompanied by cannibalism and drinking human blood. And the purpose of the ritual for fallen angels, as it were, is those who are pretending to be the gods of the nations, was an anti-creation to create human beings in their image, their likeness, just as God has made us in, our, in his image, in his likeness. And as we're called to become like Christ, the image of God, these people are to become like the demons. To be giants, therefore, is to be a fully demonized person. It's the total opposite of being a saint. And so in the conquest of Canaan was not about genocide or anything like that. It's basically, as I've said before, it's a war against vampires, literally a war against vampires. Clans of people obsessed with violence, drinking human blood, participating in all of these rituals. And in Jewish thought, demons are the spirits of killed giants. They're fully demonized people whose spirit cannot rest once it is removed from the body. So in the Old Testament, one of the Israel's main enemies is the Amalekites. And Amalek himself is said to be the grandson of Esau, Jacob's brother. So they're related. And his descendant, King Agag, would bring about the downfall of Saul, King Saul. And one of his descendants is even listed as Haman, the scheming grand vizier in the book of Esther. And in Genesis 38, we're told that Esau, the son of Eliphaz, took Timnah as a concubine and that she was Lotan's sister. Now, the name Lotan here is significant because it, it's the name Leviathan just in a different language, um, the chaos dragon in ancient mythology. So in Deuteronomy 2, Esau's child, children were meant to destroy the Horite clans, the giant clans who lived in the, that area. Uh, but Eliphaz, one of them, literally got into bed with the sister of a chap who's going around calling himself Leviathan, the chaos dragon. Um, and Moses is trying to tell us that Esau's grandson went over to the other side, but he joined in ritually with the enemy and Amalek was produced out of that union. That's why he's Israel's constant enemy. He's one of these giant clan people. So Deuteronomy chapter seven gives us the details exactly of what the Israelites are told to do to break down Canaanite altars, to smash their sacred stones, to cut down their Asherah poles, to burn Canaanite idols in the fire. If they're meant to kill everyone in the cities, then why are they told again and again, don't marry them, don't interbreed with them? Um, many scholars would argue that the text that says all men and all women are to be totally destroyed, we should understand as rhetorical sort of hyperbolic language. It's an exaggeration, it's tra trash talk. Just at the end of the football game, you might say, we totally walked all over them when nobody at any time was actually standing upon anyone else's head. You know, um, we totally walked all over them means something slightly different. John Walton, an Old Testament scholar, uses the analogy of how the Allies dealt with Germany after World War II. 
And they rounded up all of the leaders, they put them on trial, they executed them. Uh, the majority of the rank and file soldiers are just told to go home, rebuild their lives, never wear certain symbols on their uniform ever again, um, never display any of those symbols. And the Allies effectively did was destroy the identity of that was involved in that culture within Germany at the time. And that's involved, you know, the, the leaders were killed, they were put on trial, uh, the Nuremberg trials and other things. Um, and certain cities, certain strongholds were removed and destroyed. Um, but that didn't mean killing every single last German. But we might say they completely utterly destroyed the identity of the political party that was in power. So what God wanted Joshua and the Israelites to do is totally destroy those giant clan identities in the promised land. No more rituals involving cannibalism and the drinking of human blood are gonna take place. They pollute the land. And in the beginning of the book of Joshua, we see Joshua is portrayed as a second Moses figure. He calls all the tribes to obey God's law, as Moses had done at Sinai. He then sends spies out into the land, just as Moses had. They cross over the land and the River Jordan parts, just as the Red Sea had parted for Moses. And then the Israelites then recommit themselves to God by celebrating Passover in the land and circumcising all of the males. So to put a spiritual analogy in place, each of us in our own lives is like the land of Canaan. Or at least we were. We were aliens. We were strangers from God, worshipping ourselves and other created things. We were beast-like. We were ruled by our own desires and hostile to the things of God. Each of us, however, has been crucified with Christ. Our baptism symbolise our drowning of that old way of living. It's now totally destroyed. It, we're now set apart. But there's still a war going on. We still sin, we still mess up. There's a war going on inside each of us. And we've got a choice every day. Do we side with God or do we side against him? Will we come under his order or will we side with those gigantic forces of chaos who live in the land? The Israelites took the land, but the Canaanites took their hearts. The story of Israel is one long story of the nation turning away from worshipping Yahweh alone and erecting shrines to Asherah, to Baal and the other sons of El who were worshipped within Canaan. And when we read in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, we discover that most of the kings of Judah are bad, except for a few exceptions. And regarding the northern kingdom, only Jehu is seen as debatably a good figure. We, like the tribes entering the land, have passed through those waters of baptism into the promised land. And yet giants remain who need to be conquered. And we hear, do we hear the word of God and do we obey it to circumcise our hearts and to offer ourselves to the Lord for his purposes? So we're turning to Joshua chapter one, verses six to eight let us hear the words spoken to joshua as if they're for us today in the battle each of us face to submit our hearts and our minds to the will of god be strong and courageous for you are the ones who will lead these people to possess all the land that i swore to their ancestors that i would give them be strong and very courageous be careful to obey all of the instructions that moses gave you do not deviate from them turning either to the right or to the left then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So in conclusion, we have the same choice as the Israelites today. Will we place our trust in God that he will go before us to fight our battles, giving us a victory over the powers of sin and death and hell? Jesus Christ has conquered. He's won. Death has been undone. God spoke to him, to people in Joshua's day and Joshua's way, and he speaks to us today in our way. The conquest was about the land and the people because God planned to come into the world as Jesus Christ to liberate all of us from those powers that had enslaved us, the false gods who ruled over the nations. And in the same way, the battle in each one of us has already been won because Christ has won.
and one day we will be with him forever. So be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let us just pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today and we just thank you for this message. Help us to take to it heart about the war, the battle that's going on inside each one of us, Lord, that we might side with the good and resist the bad, Lord. We just thank you for the blood of Christ, which has covered all of our sins. We thank you for the waters of baptism that have cleansed us, that we have gone through our own Jordan into the promised land. We've gone through our own um, Red Sea into the wilderness, Lord. We've escaped from the land of bondage and Egypt, and we pray that you would be with us now, Lord, as we go from this place. Amen. <laughs>